At the beginning of July 1945, the war in the Pacific was almost over, but the Allies didn't know that yet. The grueling three-month Battle of Okinawa had just concluded at the end of June and had cost the Allies some 75,000 casualties, killed or wounded, had damaged 400 Allied ships, shot down 700 Allied aircraft. If Imperial Japan was on the ropes, they certainly seemed to have a lot of fight still left in them. And the Allies were already planning Operation Downfall, the proposed invasion of the Japanese home islands for that November. The predictions were bleak, with some of the estimates assuming that the Allies would take as many as a million casualties to take the home islands. In preparation for that attack, in July the Allies began the first major naval bombardment operation against the Japanese home islands. Over the course of the next month, some eight battleships, a dozen cruisers, and numerous destroyers would attack military and industrial targets in the last major naval operation of the Second World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. There were many reasons behind the decision to engage in naval bombardment of the home islands. Japan had been under sustained attack from B-29 Super Fortress bombers flying from the Mariana Islands since the fall of 1944. But significant industrial targets in the north lay outside the range of the bombers. The massive Allied fleet, the U.S. alone could field 23 battleships in 1945, could attack some of the few remaining facilities of Japanese industry that hadn't been crippled by aerial bombing. Allied command concluded that after the air losses at Okinawa, more than 1,400 Japanese aircraft had been lost in the battle, most used in kamikaze attacks, the Allied heavy ships, which had largely been used as escorts for carriers, would have relative freedom to attack. Japan coastal defenses were estimated to be light, offering little risk to the ships. The Allies were hoping to avoid the invasion by convincing the Japanese that further resistance was futile, and naval bombardment was seen as part of a combined strategy with the aerial bombing to demoralize the population. And finally, the hope was that the attacks would draw out the few remaining Japanese air and naval assets, exposing them to destruction ahead of the invasion. An Army Pictorial Service newsreel said of the operation, a naval intelligence report states that for years Japan has been scourged by Allied warplanes. Northern Honshu and Hokkaido have provided a haven for aircraft, shipping, railroads, and industries. Bombardment from the sea, coupled with strikes by planes from the carriers of Task Force 38, will now end this isolation. A December 2018 edition of the Navy Times explains, Third Fleet's objective was to apply relentless violence in hopes that Japan would stand down, but if not, lay destructive groundwork for an invasion. The initial striking force would be drawn from the U.S. Third Fleet under the command of Fleet Admiral William Halsey and the fleet's main strike element, Task Force 38, under the command of Vice Admiral John S. McKean, Sr. Task Force 38 was the fast carrier task force and included 17 aircraft carriers and six battleships. The group of fast attack carriers had played a critical role throughout the war in the Pacific since it had been created in August 1943. The task force battleships were the so-called fast battleships, battleships of the North Carolina, South Dakota, and Iowa classes, capable of making more than 27 knots to keep up with the Essex-class carriers of the task force, and mounting 16-inch main guns that could fire 2,700-pound shells a distance of up to 23 miles. The attacks would later include elements of the Royal Navy and the Royal New Zealand Navy. Allied submarines approached the home islands, searching out targets and naval mines. Allied aircraft reconnoitered targets while suppressing the Japanese ability to reconnoiter the American fleet. McCain's force sortied from the Philippines on July 1st. The task force was immense. By itself, it committed more firepower than any other Navy in history. The Navy Times reported, The power and personnel on the decks and in the ready rooms of the three task groups embodied years of planning, design, production, testing, recruiting, training, deployment, combat experience. The first attacks came from the task force air groups, the Navy Times describes the initial attacks. As a Japanese aircraft carrier armada had when nearing Hawaii in early December 1941, Task Force 38 used a weather front to mask its July 9, 1945 approach to Honshu. At 2 a.m. the next morning, the three task groups emerged, launched planes, and slipped back into the front to avoid counterattack. Weeks of elaborate planning paid handsome dividends. Virtually unopposed, even flak was meager, American pilots pummeled 12 Tokyo air airfields, destroying some 109 ground-based planes and damaging 231. The battleships arrived on July 14th, coordinating with another attack by aircraft from the task force. The attempt to draw out the Japanese air forces failed, and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters kept the planes in reserve. But this left the Imperial Japanese Navy vulnerable. U.S. submarines had severed most supply lines, and the Navy had no fuel to operate. 
His remaining ships were stuck in port, unable to maneuver and without air cover. The planes of the task force rained fire on the nearby defenseless vessels, sinking 11 warships and damaging 8 more, as well as sinking or damaging scores of merchant vessels. The Imperial Japanese Navy would suffer many more losses to the planes of Task Force 38 over the coming weeks. Meanwhile, the battleships USS South Dakota, Indiana, and Massachusetts, the heavy cruisers USS Quincy in Chicago, and nine destroyers targeted the ironworks at Kamaishi in northern Honshu. Kamaishi was a major foundry town that included an iron mill run by the Japan Iron and Steel Company. The mill, which had been founded in 1880, was one of the largest mills operated by Japan's largest iron producer. According to a 1968 paper written for East Central State College, Oklahoma, the mill had produced its peak production in 1943 when it had produced 426,000 tons of pig iron and semi-finished steel, although by the summer of 1945 a shortage of coking coal and other materials had the mill running at less than half capacity. At 10.55 in the morning, the task group flagship USS South Dakota hoisted a signal. It read, Never forget Pearl Harbor. Reporter James Lindsley of the San Bernardino County Sun was on board the South Dakota. He wrote, High explosives bearing Made in America stamp whistled for two hours from flaming muzzles of big navy guns into the great Japanese ironworks at Kamiishi in northern Hanzu today. It was my privilege to watch the bombardment of Japan for the first time in this war, a bombardment which caused sky-reaching explosions and started roaring fires which blanketed the area with smoke. Admiral Samuel Morrison chronicled the effect in his landmark 1960 work, The History of the United States Naval Operations in World War II. Firing commenced at 12.10 p.m. from a range of 29,000 yards, and over the course of a two-hour bombardment, the group fired 802 16-inch shells, 728 8-inch shells, and 825 5-inch shells. Morrison explains that the concussion from all the firing caused kitchen fires to spread throughout the city of some 40,000 residents. An August 2020 edition of the Japan Times wrote that much of the bombardment targeted a local iron mill run by Japan Iron and Steel Company, but the entire city burned to the ground. The Times quoted Kinji Sano, who was 14 at the time of the attack. Soon we began to hear the crackling sound more vividly. I thought it was the rain, but when I peeped outside there were no ripples in the pond in our garden. When I looked back, our house was engulfed in flames. We jumped out from the shelter. Sano ran to another shelter, which also caught fire and eventually escaped, running over a hill. When the attack ended, he told the Times, he went back to find out that his home had been burned to the ground. It was the second time his home had been destroyed. It had been washed away in a tsunami in 1933, when he was just two years old. Another survivor, Toko Wada, was quoted on the Japan Economic Newswire in 2015, comparing the devastation of the city to the 2011 tsunami there. The distressing scene was the same at the time. Wada, who was 15 when the city was bombarded, said recently in a room at a nursing home for the aged in Kamaishi, the whole town was gone. I got choked up inside as I thought I'd never wanted to see it that way again. Smoke from the fires prevented naval aircraft from spotting for the ships, but they were able to continue their fire on predetermined targets. Most remarkably, the ships saw virtually no opposition, with no coastal fire or planes responding. The only military response was from a small submarine chaser in the harbor, sunk quickly by naval gunfire. The fleet was so confident that radio silence was not maintained. The headline in the sun read, Yank ships swagger back and forth off Japanese coast. The Allies did not even attempt to hide the names of the ships involved. The bombardment did significant damage to the mill, although the full extent wasn't known until after the war. The fires destroyed more than 1,400 homes and killed more than 400 civilians. There would have been no Allied casualties that night, except that, unknown to the Allies at the time, British and Dutch prisoners of war were being used as slave labor at the factory. Five were killed in the bombardment. And ships of the task force were already moving into position for another attack. The battleships USS Iowa, Missouri, and Wisconsin, along with the light cruisers Atlanta and Dayton, moved into position the night of the 14th, and began an attack on another steel mill outside the town of Moron on Hokkaido firing 860 16-inch shells and severely damaging the mill's operation. Halsey himself was present for the attack, aboard his flagship, USS Missouri. Two days later, Iowa, Missouri, and Wisconsin were joined by North Carolina, Alabama, and HMS King George V for an attack on the Honshu city of Hitachi, a center of electronics manufacturing. The Melbourne Australian newspaper The Age noted that the addition of HMS King George V meant that the British fleet shelled Japan for the first time. And the bombardment force, as in earlier shellings, acted in complete disdain of the enemy's navy and air force. One correspondent, broadcasting from a battleship, the paper wrote, 
said the third fleet was pouring shells in at a rate of 50,000 pounds a minute. While the battleships fired over 1,500 shells from their 16 and 14 inch guns, rain and fog made targeting difficult. The bombardment did more damage to the city's residential area than to the industrial area. A raid the next day by B-29s using incendiary bombs resulted in near total destruction of the city's urban area. The results of the bombardments had been decidedly mixed. While the damage to facilities was not as severe as had been hoped, and the actions had failed to draw out the remaining air assets as Allied planners had hoped, Japan had proven virtually defenseless. A June 2020 edition of The National Interest concludes, The attacks incurred no Japanese response, seemed to have inflicted some damage, so Admiral William Halsey decided to continue them. The fleet moved to regroup and resupply. Samuel J. Cox, the director of the Naval History and Heritage Command, wrote in 2020, on 21-22 July, 3rd Fleet conducted what is probably the largest single replenishment at sea operation in history. Over 100 ships received 6,369 tons of ammunition, 379,157 barrels of fuel oil, 1,635 tons of stores and provisions, 99 replacement aircraft, and 412 replacement personnel from the oilers, ammunition ships, store ships, and escort carriers of Task Group 30.8, commanded by Rear Admiral Donald B. Beery, an unsung hero, World War II. It's telling that at this point in the war, fueling the fleet was a greater challenge than facing the enemy. The, the risk of a typhoon was a greater concern than the Imperial Japanese Navy. The bombardments continued, including a second attack on Kamiishi in August that killed more civilians and POWs. Several air raids on the naval base at Kure, Japan in the latter part of July damaged or destroyed most of what was left of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Admiral McCain opposed the attacks, finding them unnecessary and fearing risk to his pilots at a base with a strong anti-air defense, but Nimitz wanted the threat neutralized. The night of July 22nd and 23rd, a group of destroyers attacked and sank a Japanese freighter. Two small Japanese naval vessels, a minesweeper and a subchaser, briefly engaged the U.S. destroyers, but didn't damage them. That was the last substantial surface engagement between the U.S. and Imperial Japanese navies. Despite the continued attacks, the war was, of course, at its end. The last attack in Kamiishi occurred on August 9th, the same day a B-29 called Boxcar dropped the second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. But there was still more death to come in the waning days of the war. Task Force planes were in the air the morning of August 15th when word arrived that the Emperor had agreed to surrender. The planes were recalled, but several were attacked by Japanese planes, either pilots who had not been informed of the sea's fire or who were too fanatical to accept surrender. Knowing there could still be a risk from kamikazes, Halsey gave the order to shoot any aircraft approaching the fleet down, in a friendly manner. At least five Allied pilots died in air battles that day. More than 30 Japanese planes were shot down. It was the last substantial air battle of the Second World War. While Japan had officially surrendered, it took a long time for that word to spread, and combat operations continued in Manchuria, in China, in Southeast Asia. It's really unclear who fired the last shots of the war in the Pacific. Analysis after the war found that the naval bombardment had done more damage to industry than initially had been suspected, but that even the 16-inch naval guns didn't do as much damage as the 1 and 2,000 pound bombs of the naval aircraft. Admiral McCain made his opinion clear. He thought that the aircraft that had been assigned to defend the battleships would have done more damage than the battleships themselves. It was determined that the naval bombardment had a significant impact on the population's morale, but it appears that the Japanese high command didn't pay much attention to the morale of the populace and that the naval bombardment didn't play any significant role in the eventual decision to surrender. It can certainly be argued that the entire operation was unnecessary and in fact might have been motivated more by revenge than strategic purposes. The deployment of the battleships certainly represents an ironic twist as the war had started with the Japanese sinking U.S. battleships at Pearl Harbor. Still, the U.S. could not have known what military pressure was necessary to compel the Japanese to surrender. Still, the battleships did themselves little favors. As the national interest notes, the raids were only successful because Japan was almost completely prostrate from a military sense. Against a better resourced foe, the magazine argues, even the battleships would have had trouble defending themselves from submarines and air attacks, and thus the raids offered no plausible logic to retain large numbers of battleships. But a few did remain and found service. The last two battleships, USS Iowa and USS Wisconsin, were not stricken from the U.S. naval rolls until 2006. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button.
If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.